Episode number 94 of People I Know Show from Alaska with Luke Bozer. Hello. Hello. We both went to Browerville High School, Little Browerville, Minnesota. And as I arrived today, it was the first time we'd probably seen each other in... 20 some, years. Yeah, we'll call it 20. Rounded up. Rounded up to 20. Yeah. And you're, you're one of these people, you, you just, you kind of took off right after high school. Yeah, just kind of took off and, you know, it's just uh, finding my way back was like never really a, an option, you know. There's too many other things going on, career choices, and you just kind of start going one way and just kind of leaned into it. And it's brought me to Alaska and I'm still here, so. And... We were chatting a bit, and I'm trying to figure out most of the time has been in Alaska. Not all of it, but <clears throat> the majority of the last 17, 18 years. <clears throat> Almost all of it I spent. Uh, so I joined the Air Force February 2004. And uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base was my first assignment. And then I did three years here. Went to Korea for a year, Kunsan Air Base out there. So one year there, I was supposed to get stationed in Florida, but that got canceled and then got the opportunity to come back to Alaska. So I did another tour and then ended up getting out at like seven and a half, eight years active duty time and then went to college for a while and then kind of got like a big boy job and uh, kind of been doing that same thing ever since then. So um that job brought us to Hawaii, my wife and I to mm -hmm. Hawaii. We spent almost two years there. And then, you know, six months in Las Vegas for work and a few other times traveling around, so, but. Was it the Air Force <clears throat> then that brought you here initially or yeah. you wanted to be here? Uh, the Air Force, yeah. Okay, and then so, once you got here, you started thinking this might be the place? Yeah, I'd say after like two or three years, it was like, well, once I kind of went to Korea, and left and I was like, man, that kind of kind of place like Alaska is somewhere I'd like to maybe, you know, end up living, you know, so I had the opportunity to come back. So definitely jumped on it. Um, and then now, like my wife, you know, she grew up here in Anchorage. So it kind of cements a little bit more of a reason to stay here. So and I have to admit, seeing you, you look like you belong here. Like, is there a, <laughs> is there a place on Earth that you belong more than Alaska? Uh, you know, I guess the, well, <clears throat> I guess a guy with a beard, you know, it's easy to say <laughs> that guy could be from Alaska. You but know, I or, see the difference between me and you, I, I can tell like you, whatever a man's man is like, you can build that's stuff a and, Thank you. <laughs> and you can, you can just do all these things. Like I can grow a beard, <clears throat> but I can't do any of the shit that you can do. I can just already tell that. <clears throat> so Alaska is a very, like, uh, I cut call it like a come as you are state okay you know there's no like uh the nicest restaurant in town like i could go i'm just kind of wearing some yard clothes now but like <laughs> it wouldn't be a problem for me to just you know hop in the truck and go there and have a beer and a burger or whatever the place is you know it's like the standards here are like dirty hands and car hearts, you know, and you can go, that's like your ticket in anywhere. What about something that's more fine dining, if that exists, which I so, assume it does. <clears throat> fine dining, you know, like if you're going to go have like a nice dinner, you know, it, probably you're going to be cleaned up. But uh, for example, there used to be this bar up here called Platinum Jacks. And when it first opened, there was a, like a dress code. And if you didn't have a <laughs> collared shirt on, you know, they were like not letting you in the door. And then after like a few months of that, it was like nobody was going there because it was like they, they thought it was, you know, bullshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people so to get don't more, conform to that. Yeah. So to get more business, they just kind of like, yeah, all right, we, we need you to come in and have some drinks. So they let that slide. So is that place still in business? Not in business. Anymore. <laughs> and the many bars that took its place after that, it's just they haven't succeeded. So. There's a, a trip that you were on recently that I want to talk about, but I want to get a better understanding <clears throat> more about like what day-to-day -day life is here. One thing I noticed is I came at a pretty good time of the year to like yes. 
have daylight, mm -hmm. plenty of it, maybe too much in my opinion. Um, and it's just a beautiful place to visit, certainly, mm -hmm. that I'm seeing so far. Yep. Um, the, sc the scenery and the landscape, like I've seen mountains, I've seen uh, bodies of water, but somehow the way that the bodies of water meet the mountains here and the mm -hmm. way the snow with some yep. glaciers, it's really a beautiful place. And there's so many trees <clears throat> everywhere. Yeah, you got like the, the green of the spruce trees and then like the glacier fed waters are like emerald blue yeah. and the snow and it's like summertime but you still see snow and it's you can hike up and touch it and make a snowman or whatever you want to do and um yeah it's definitely a unique place so it's a different type of paradise i would, I would imagine here in the summer <clears throat> but then there's the winter the winter yeah can you so, contrast the two <clears throat> like what what type of life are you living in the summer compared to the winter um the winters are hard because if you don't know it gets dark here for a very long time um in Anchorage, where we live, the sunlight goes from like 10 to 3 p.m. So unless you're outside in those hours, you're probably not going to see the sun. So if you got like an office job or something, it could be <laughs> pretty rough on you. Oh. you know? um, but the biggest thing about winter is you have to <clears throat> you have to be out in like your social circles. You know, if you have like a gym membership or you know things that you're involved in like you have to do those and communicate with people and just be out otherwise it's so easy to sock yourself in the house and you know whether you're like drinking or you're not eating good or you know the winter things can just kind of go down because without sun you kind of get start getting depressed so it's like in minnesota where we're from <clears throat> seasonal depression is the thing i probably had it a little bit i know some people yeah. get it much more se severely than i do here is it like a bigger thing yeah it's a thing i don't know how big it is because i mean for my wife and i you know we stay pretty active um so it's one of those things you kind of have to you know take care of yourself otherwise it's gonna it's just going to set in and it's not, you're not going to re realize until you're just sitting there one day and you need to book a vacation or something, you know? <laughs> I was to Seward for a little part of this little vacation, which is a two hour drive uh, yesterday. I, I'd, I'd imagine like that's a, <clears throat> that's a place to go for vacation when people come to visit Anchorage or if you're living in Anchorage, but it's, it's not that hard to get to, but yeah. There's also not many places, there must not so, be that many places like it here, right? There's like vacation spots, where do people so, vacation? Uh, vacationing, you can definitely do it in Alaska, you know, but there is some instances where you have to make, Seward could be a day trip. Mm -hmm. You know, when the fish are running, you're going to hop in after work and go down there for a couple hours and drive back. Uh, the Russian River, same thing, you know, you hop in, that's about the same distance away. Um, it's, I was correlated to like, when I, when I was a kid, I grew up and my grandparents' house was like an hour away. And when yeah. I was little, it seemed so far away. But like, now I just have to do that here on a daily basis if I want to go, you know, hike somewhere or yeah. try to go fishing or, you know, whatever I'm up to. It's like, that's just part of the life here is like logging in some miles and to get, you know, to, to get out and do the things that you want to do, you know, so... Yeah, time had a different impact as a kid. I remember those drives an hour to St. Cloud. Right. And it's like, so far away. So far. No, it's, all, it's, it's nothing. Get in the car. I, enjoy the, I enjoy drives like that yeah. usually. And I mean, Alaska is so big too. If you're going to head to Fairbanks, uh, you know, that's a six hour drive. So if you want to go there for the weekend, you better buckle in and just hit the road. Like, would you, have you done that? Yes. A few times. Just like to see a different part of Alaska? Uh, usually when there's things going on, I don't just go to Fairbanks to hang out, you know, <laughs> I've went up there hunting a few times, uh, but usually if we have something going on up there, just make the drive. I have flown it a few times, which is much easier. Okay. I, would, know, yeah. I would agree with that. What's the, the snowy season like here and the way the roads are maintained, <clears throat> like getting around in Alaska, um, what's that like? They, they do a really good job, like, in town, I guess, making sure everything is good. But the snow usually comes November, lasts until April. Um, and, I mean, 
it really all depends on how much it snows. Um, but the thing that will get you, like we just said, driving places can take like two hours, you know. So if you're going to head down to Seward uh, and let's just say a blizzard, I mean, the highway could be whiteout conditions and Seems like icy. A bad day to go or, to Seward then. You know, it's a lot, a lot of coast, so sometimes it's warmer, oh, so it's, yeah. it could be raining and it could just be, it could be awesome or it could be hell. So you got to kind of just be prepared and to not leave the house and just think it's going to be like an easy trip, you know. As we speak in the, the late part of spring 2021, there's a <clears throat> car rental shortage, I think, everywhere based on how the pandemic affected those businesses and liquidating a lot of the cars. So I rented through Turo, which is a like peer-to-peer -peer app. Mm -hmm. And the guy with the, the car that I rented explained to me about the, I think he called it the Alaskan windshield, that he's, he said he already fixed it twice. There's a like big crack on it because mm -hmm. unlike what I'm used to in Minnesota, which I think does a pretty good job with the roads, using sand and occasionally salt. And the thing that makes other parts of the United States when they get barely any snow just shut down because they have like none of these tools in place to make the, right. the ice and snow go away. <laughs> Here, they use rocks. Is that right? It's like uh, like pea gravel. Okay. You know, they'll use sand and pea gravel, usually on intersections and parking lots. Um, and then inherently, those will end up on your windshield. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I, I told you earlier, my truck has had a cracked wind, windshield for since I've had it, since 2008, and it's just really not an issue for me. Mm -hmm. Being so tall, I kind of just sit over it, so <laughs> it's not really a problem, but I mean, we had a Subaru and that got pretty dinged up, and uh, it's one of those things you just gotta roll with it, or get it fixed, Yeah, whatever you need to do. It sounds like the auto glass mm -hmm. repair shops, it's a, it's a good They're business here. Busy, yeah. People cry, like when it first snows, and. Anchorage is kind of transient in a way. A lot of people coming and going. So when it snows and people just crashing into each other, they've never driven in snow before, you know. Oh. So, what's the advantage mm -hmm. do you think from the the pea gravel, the sand compared to what Minnesota does? Well, <clears throat> so I mean, in theory, hopefully to provide some traction when you're trying to go, when you're trying to break, and then. In Alaska, too, you're also allowed to use studs. Mm -hmm. So one of the big deals is like the tire changeover, you know. Uh, I think in October or something, you have uh, another set of tire, snow tires with uh, studs in them. And then you swap those over. And I think in May is like the deadline to get them removed. Okay. This has been an education to me. I, I traveled near Lake Tahoe in December but the weather was pretty good there. I was mm -hmm. to the Grand Canyon in February. And in those areas, typically you're putting chains on your tires there in the winter. Mm -hmm. And I've never done that in Minnesota. Yeah. It's just not the way we do things. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm learning so much about yeah, how that's other what, states and handle it. Honestly, I've only had studs for the Subaru we had because growing up in Minnesota, it was like, oh, we, if you need, like, if it's slippery, just put four wheel drive on. It's yeah. going to be good. And so for my daily driver, it's, I mean, just four wheel drive and uh, it's been fine. No issues. So it's good enough here. Good enough. Yeah, way But good. for a non four wheel drive vehicle, they'd better do something with their tires. Uh, even like the front wheel drive cars, you know, like that. I had a, my first car front wheel drive. Those get around just fine. I mean, same here. You might have an issue if you're trying to go up, go up a mountain or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those things that people like to split all the little details, you know, there's always guys, what's the best tire to run in Alaska? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, as long as you're not run, running like a huge mud tire in the middle of winter, it's, you know, if you have a, like a decent all-terrain tire, it will be fine. Yeah. Okay. So educational conversation here on yeah. that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I would come here in the winter though. Like, but I'd imagine some people <laughs> you do. You should, though. It's, but yeah, you definitely should. I, I, I guess people that are into skiing are into what else? What would people so, want to do here in the winter? Uh, well, there's like, there was just one ski resort, Alyeska, and 
now out in like the what we call the Valley Palmer Wasilla area. They just opened another one. Uh, I haven't been out there, but aside from that, there is. I mean, outdoor sports, the snow machining, which is its own. We don't say snowmobiling here. Okay, so same thing. Snow machining, yeah. Is it still Polaris and Articat and Skidoo? Yeah, whatever you like to drive. You know, whatever. Are those still the ones? Or does yeah. someone else enter that market? They're still the ones, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the Northern Lights, like once you start getting around oh, okay. Denali, uh, up into Fairbanks, they have uh, like China Hot Springs. There's like a whole winter escapade you could go on and uh okay you know, it might be negative 40 degrees yeah you know you can dress for any weather right yeah but to, to be out like uh in that environment when it's cold and the northern lights are just going bananas um i mean it's it's a unique experience okay you're beginning to sell me on this <clears throat> this is just my little sample three-day trip and it here. isn't like you know it isn't like every weekend you just drive out and do that you know for living here you know you're you're not always out in all those adventures you know like you think you would be you know so there's like finite moments when all these magical things kind of happen and it it makes it makes it kind of special you know then is that a, an annual winter thing that you do is go see some of this and take it yeah. in <clears throat> there's a little town called Telkeetna which is also about two hours away and it's kind of like a little hippie town uh, there's all sorts of little shops. There's a pizza shop, um, and they have all sorts of little uh, bed and breakfast things out there. You can stay, um, and it's from the town. You can see Denali mm. on a on a clear day, which is a national park, yeah. national forest, both. Uh, both, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's huge. I think, right? Huge. Twenty three thousand feet elevation, if I'm not mistaken. You could actually see it from Anchorage on a clear day, which is 200 some miles away. So does it mean it's a mountain as well, or mountain range? Yeah. Okay. It's well. It used to be called Mount McKinley. Oh. They and changed the name. They changed the name uh, to Denali because that was the, I guess, like the tribe. Okay. Um, or that's what they called it. Yep. So, and the reason it was McKinley is because the governor of Somebody from Ohio had, like, picked the name. <laughs> and, I mean, the whole Denali thing, this, this was just a few years ago, too. It was just kind of nonsense. And, but people still called it. People, some people called it Denali. Some called it McKinley. So I guess they, in the bureaucratic world, they had to make it official. And, and a generation or two all called Denali, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So I was driving behind someone that was driving a Yukon Denali. I forget what, what car makes that but i never i don't know i never thought i'd heard that name before but i never like put it together yeah <clears throat> so if you're and you just did let's talk about that you you came up with an excursion you wanted to do that was somewhere you can't mm -hmm. drive to which i i think i guess is common the state is huge there's more lakes yeah. by far mm -hmm. than like minnesota claims Land of 10,000 10, lakes, which right. is correct. Mm -hmm. Alaska doesn't say anything about their, what, 100,000 or whatever? The, it's 50,000? I yeah, forget what it is. It's, it's a lot. There. Yeah, it's a lot. In most of the mm -hmm. state, people either haven't been to or really difficult to get to, right? Yeah, so the road system is very small. You know, there's like a road that comes in through Canada, and then there's a road that goes to the top of the state. In a nutshell, that's about it. Um, so to get out into like western Alaska or other interior villages or towns like the only option is the fly okay so and the airports um, can't be very big so you're probably not <laughs> flying on very large planes my hunch imagine a tin shack with a few chairs in it and nobody checks your luggage <laughs> <laughs> depending on what you're doing the tin shack is the airport like the pretty the, much the, yeah the terminal or concourse yeah. or whatever yeah they just show up plane lands who's flying to anchorage me <laughs> and you literally just throw your bags on the plane. Do you fly your own planes? People do. Okay. So that's a... <clears throat> uh, on the north end of town, there's a small airport called Merrill Field, and that is one of the largest small aircraft airports in the world, I guess. Um, and there's a lake called Lake Hood, float planes near the airport. 
Uh, so that's a big thing to be able to get out uh, in Alaska is to have a plane. Okay. Because it gives you access to way more since the road system is so, so small. You were in the Air Force. Do you have any flying experience with that or do you have all different roles? I took, I started the private pilots course and got deployed and never picked it back up. So. Okay. But I work with a guy who flies and know a lot of people with airplanes. You've, you've probably got some good connections. Yeah, if I want to go for a ride like today, I probably could. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I know, I know you got busy plans later, but that's interesting. I, I just, so much of this, as I was telling you when I got here, I, just, I don't think about Alaska. I don't know <clears throat> that there's a, a lot, lot of people of, do. There's a lot of, uh, because of reality TV, and whatever nonsense is out there, like people think of Alaska as like being a certain way. And then once you get here, it's not what you expect at all. I know when I first was on the plane flying up here, I, I just imagined it was gonna be like pine trees and dirt roads, and there wasn't gonna be much of an infrastructure. And then I'm on my way to the base and there's a Walmart and there's holiday gas stations and stoplights. And it seems like a normal place. And it does seem like that now, but it seems like, based on a little history that I gathered, more recently than most places, it did have dirt roads. And like Anchorage was called Tent City, I think, initially. Mm -hmm. And it was about 100 years ago, I think I read, is when it <clears throat> began to mm -hmm. evolve into a place with it. But even like the 50s and 60s, it was just kind of turning into a small city. You okay. know? And where I live, people actually used to have small houses in this area and that was their cabin from Anchorage. Okay. You know, which is only like 10 minute drive away downtown per se, but people would have their cabins like out here. Like the city itself is, must be pretty big. Cause I, I saw there are 250,000 or so of people here mm -hmm. and it just doesn't seem densely populated. So it must be very spread out. Yeah. Very spread out. It's, it's uh, you kind of get into these different neighborhoods and it feels like you're kind of in a different city because everything's set up so different, you know, but you're still in the same town. It's kind of encapsulated by the, the mountains. Uh, so they call it the Anchorage Bowl. And uh, I mean, I always say like everything in town's like 15 minutes away, <laughs> which, which is pretty much true. You know, you can hop in and the traffic isn't bad and you can kind of get anywhere. Um, 10, 15 minutes and you're there. Yeah, it hasn't been bad driving around a few days. The, a lot of one ways, which they caught me the one time. I was a moron going the wrong way in the one way and I figured it out pretty yeah, fast. Yeah, especially downtown. You take yeah. a wrong turn and you're like, oh crap. <laughs> so I, I think I was getting in the direction and then I got back to Anchorage here. You, you were gone for about a week and I planned this trip late notice mm -hmm. because I saw a good flight deal and I don't like to pass up good flight deals to places I haven't been to that I want to go to. And I was able to, to pull it off, reached out to you, figured you'd respond. And then I didn't hear from you for a while. I'm like, I don't think that's on purpose. He's not avoiding me. I found one of your Instagram, Instagram pages and I got the impression that you might be in the middle of nowhere. And it turns out you were. I was in the middle of nowhere. So, <laughs> so tell me about this trip to the middle of nowhere and, and what you did. Okay. There's a lot of details. So I'll, try, okay. to, I'll try to lay them out there clearly. Um, my father-in-law is friends with this guy who guided in Alaska, uh, in the Arctic, in the Southeast, all over Alaska. He's hunted in Africa and basically invited my father-in-law to go on a bear hunt. Mm. <clears throat> he has a fishing boat out in Bristol Bay, a big salmon run. So he has to get ready for that. So pretty much said, Hey, why don't you take me? So geared up and uh, basically flew to Sandpoint, Alaska, which is on Popoff Island, approximately 800 miles down the Aleutian chain. How far of a flight is that on a smaller plane? It was a two and a half hour flight. Okay. So, um, which, you know, you think of, a, you take a two and a half hour flight anywhere else and you're going to be in a different state. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, the guy, I went with his name is Norm Goldslogger. <laughs> That's a good name. And I met him one time a few weeks before everything went down. 
And <clears throat> he's, he's like 70 years old, by the way. I just have to throw that out there. Okay. So he's an old guy, but he has a lot of experience. So if you're going to go brown bear hunting for your first time, why not go with a guy that's guided and hunted a crap ton of time so you're not just going out there without knowing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So we get to Sandpoint, and we still have to get from there back across to the back to Alaska, the mainland of Alaska. And we get there without really having that trip cemented in yet. Like in what way? <clears throat> so there's a guy he used to use that had a landing craft boat who would load up all your gear, dump you on the beach, and that's where you're hunting. That guy, not doing it anymore. So Norm is a mechanic, like factory certified for GM all that stuff, got in contact with a guy out there who needed some work done on a pickup truck. So we had to bring out like an OBD2 sensor and a steering wheel puller, and I had to ship down a distributor and a test light and all this stuff so we could try to get this guy's truck working so we could barter for a trip (laughs) in a boat to get to where we wanted to go hunting. So... There was a lot of variables that had to play through to actually make this hunt a success because we were just kind of doing everything like it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we flew out there and then come to find out everything works. So this guy's truck, we didn't actually get it fixed all the way, but it's close. Made progress. So his nephew has a 48-foot Saner, which is a, a fishing boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, big nets and you basically they call it a purse saner it uh, run the nets out and they pop this thing in the water and it catches all the salmon and they hoist it on board Um, so this kid his name was Billy agrees to take us for a ride on his boat so it was a four hour boat ride from this island back across to where we're going to hunt. So this, I think, helps to describe Alaska. The best way to get to this part of Alaska <clears throat> on the mainland was to go to an island <clears throat> yes. and get a boat, which you weren't even sure you could get, and you found a way to get yes. on this boat for four hours. And now you could, they have a, a plane up here called the Super Cub, which is like an excellent, it's got big tires, lightweight, you can pack some, you know, a, a pilot and a hunter and some gear, and they can pop out and they can land in like anything. Mm. You know, they can land on the beach, they can land on the tundra, they can... They can get you out there. So that's the best way to go to the remote places. In that instance, that would have been perfect, but um, all the the guiding services and outfitters were booked with their own clients. So the chance of us getting a flight on a Super Cub was like, they were too busy taking care of their own people. Mm-hmm. And the reason why that's so is because this Alaska Peninsula brown bear hunt is, some guys it's like, they spend their life savings to go on that hunt. I mean, it could be anywhere from like twenty to forty thousand dollars, depending on the guide and the services provided. I wow. mean, guys are spending some serious money to do that. So it's a once in a lifetime trip for most people, I'd imagine. Once in a lifetime trip. <clears throat> so that's why I was like, okay, well, I got to do this, mm-hmm. you know. And even from somebody being here, it still costs a little bit of money, but nothing like not nowhere in the ballpark of. Twenty to forty thousand bucks. This is where knowing a few people saved you a lot of money and got you the. Tip. Yeah, this is where being a local definitely came through. Okay. So, <clears throat> we take this boat to the hunting grounds, four-hour boat ride, and throw the stuff in a skiff, haul it to shore, and now we get there. It's like a, it's a Monday, the tenth. It's eleven o'clock at night, and we're literally in the middle of nowhere, right? <clears throat> Now we got to set up camp. It's starting to get dark. You know, we're like trying to get that all taken care of <clears throat> and go to bed. First morning, uh, we're kind of messing with camp, getting a little more things set up. And here comes a brown bear right into camp. Uh, talk about being caught off guard. <laughs> We jokingly just said, hey, we ought to put some ammo in our rifles just to have, you know, 
next to a tree or you know have it with you yeah um, i had a 44 chest holster i was wearing that so i had something you know but <clears throat> norm the guide um basically was said this bear two-year-old bear we need to scare it away so we had to fire a few shots at it and we're like banging on stuff and like yelling at it and eventually it takes off why, why two years old do you have to scare it away any reason they're <clears throat> they're just small and out there there's like a categories of size for a bear and it's like 10 foot plus bear okay. it could be hunted out in, the, in this area so which is a huge i mean just a huge animal did you need to get like a, a license or a tag to even do this yeah and in the size that mattered the size of the bear doesn't matter okay. it's just the brown bear permit okay. essentially for that game unit so um him knowing that there's much bigger bears okay in such thick bear country was like don't shoot it we can get this bear out of here and so we did and it, it kind of circled around us and it was walking down the beach and there was a some other guys who had landed on the far end of the bay we were in um, who landed on the Super Cubs and were watching this bear walk down the beach through the binoculars and next thing you know they're like waving and the bears coming into their camp and they had to fire a bunch of shots and uh, so I don't, don't know wanna, if they ended up having to shoot it. You don't want to um, kill it but you also don't want it to like cause problems in your camp, <clears throat> right? Is that the point of yeah. scaring it away? And now according to him humans are not on their menu when they come out of the den. They're looking to get grass and stuff to open up their digestive tracts um, and just get ready for, like, the salmon. It's mating season, so they're trying to take care of all that. Um, so they're really not that interested in people. Is this area remote enough that these bears would have never seen people before? Totally. Most yeah. likely. Most likely, yeah. So, in fact, in all the commotion... Norm said that he's never seen a human before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as our guns are dry, don't shoot it, Luke, don't shoot it. It's never seen a human before. He was like, even though he wasn't like guiding me, he fell into this cadence of like, just based off his experience. It was kind of, it's kind of cool, you know? So, okay, I, I'm gonna have a billion questions. Does, <clears throat> based on what you, you heard from him, would a, a bear that's never seen humans, would it take a human as a threat initially or is that like a learned behavior for bears i have no idea of this i think it, it depends you know somewhere out there like there's only going to be people there like during the hunting season so the chances of it seeing another person for a long time is pretty great mm -hmm. so but somewhere like here in anchorage or any other populated place yeah you start to mix like the lives of bears and people together and that's when you can have some stuff go down really yeah uh, especially like salmon season everybody's got fish guts in their garbage or oh, people okay. are out hiking and then there's bear cubs you know uh, there's a lot of things that can happen quickly so if but out in a place like that where they're not really associated with people like I mean I, I really wasn't even scared of the bears you know <laughs> So, and you've seen a lot of bears, though, I'd imagine. We've seen quite a few. Uh, but I don't know. It's hard to describe the, the feeling of how it... I mean, just having that bear come into camp. <laughs> but I never really felt like it was going to come at me. Yeah. I kind of felt like kind of in control of the situation. Were you deceiving yourself with this? I don't know, man. <laughs> it, it, it's like it happened so quick. How big is was, a two-year-old bear? I mean, maybe seven foot, eight Big enough foot. to cause you lots of problems if you... Oh, it, it could take your head off. Okay. Like, no questions. <laughs> but, yeah, just him knowing that there's bigger bears out there, he called the shots, and we got it out of there. And we definitely had a laugh over it after a little while. So... Okay, let's get back to the story. You... I interrupt you when you're saying right when you get there, you see the bear. And I know so much so, more happened after that. Yep. So the bear comes into camp. We scare it off, goes down the beach, gets into some other guy's camp. And for all we know, it it ran off or they either shot it. Not, not too sure. And then 
Later in the day, this is the first day of actually hunting, another bear is coming down the beach. And it just looks like, you see the binoculars, you're like, wow, that's big. <laughs> you know, you see it and you're like, Phew. And uh, that's actually the bear that I shot. And it walked all the way down the beach to about where our camp was. There was a little river that dumped into the ocean. And I just, I went down this little grass embankment and I laid prone and the bear turned away from me or kind of quartering away from me. And it just was the perfect, perfect shot. A hundred yards, 102 yards, mm. uh, two shots. And that was it. So it's, uh, like Norm says, it's like 95% just sitting there looking for bears uh -huh. and then 5% of excitement, <laughs> which is like pretty much what it was, you know, because it's, even though we saw it coming, the whole getting down there, getting set up for the shot, and it just was over so quick. It's hard to like capture that little memory. And that was uh, the first morning of the first full day? The first afternoon. First afternoon of yep. the first full day. Yeah. So not, he said not too many people get a bear on their first day. Is so. this the easiest hunt you've ever been on for anything? <laughs> Other than the logistical details, okay, it, yes. it actually went pretty easy. <laughs> Easier than a moose hunt I went on in the fall off the road system. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so the bear, the shooting it and everything like that, it's <clears throat> over so quick. And then now we got to like get a bag ready to go, get all the stuff to skin it. We got to cross a river, so we got to mind all that stuff. And it's only like 150 yards from the camp. Like in the picture, you can see the tent in the background. <laughs> and the sun was shining. And it wasn't windy, so the weather was pretty perfect for that area, which is notorious for having terrible weather. Mm. Like, uh, like earlier we mentioned, like you can get stuck out there for like two weeks, and if a plane can't come in because of weather, it's like, well, you're stuck. So to have that be. Airplane. <laughs> the sun shining no wind we were able to get it taken care of so being that we still had another week out there <clears throat> and norm won an opportunity to get a bear we had was to it call just you and him just me and him oh i thought your father-in-law was out there no, no he, 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 yeah, he bailed he okay. bailed so <laughs> okay so yeah just us two so now norm is up to get a bear so to preserve the bear we have to call billy to drive the boat because we forgot to bring salt to put on the hide. You know, we get the hide all laid out, <clears throat> excuse me, put salt on it or, you know, get it you know, on a freezer if you could, but mm -hmm. we were out in the middle of nowhere. So you didn't find a little outlet for your freezer <laughs> yeah, out there? No, I mean, it was like 40 ish degrees, so okay. it was cool, you know, but sometimes in the day it would get kind of warm and sunny. So we didn't want to, I didn't want to ruin this thing. You know, I'm on this big trip. I don't want to ruin the bear hide. Yeah. So he makes another trip, which we had to pay for as well. Um, salt. So I <clears throat> get the bear wrapped up, ride with him on the skiff to the boat, lay the bear out, pack it full of salt, roll it up in a tarp. He hauls it back to town for me and brings it to one of the seafood processing places on Sandpoint. And they put it in a freezer on a pallet for me. So it's like, <laughs> okay, this is like perfect. <clears throat> So the rest of the days out there, we saw one more bear 200 yards in front of the tent early in the morning. And it was kind of darting through some alder bushes and never got the opportunity to get a shot. I mean, by the time it was in this clearing, it was like six, 700 yards away mm. with a big giant animal. Even though you're shooting a high caliber rifle, you don't really want to be taking that kind of shot. What would be the furthest distance that you'd really <laughs> go for? I would say less than 300. Okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, imagine like walking through the thickest brushy forest you've ever been in. Things you have to like contort yourself to get through and the bears can just plow through that. And if you shoot something and it goes into that, it's a lot of work. Mm. First, you got to find it. And then second of all, you got to be able to get there. Mind you, you could be hiking straight up a mountain. <laughs> so 
you definitely don't want to have uh, any tricks. You know, you want it to be basically dead right away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dead and an open area that you can you can know, get to. You know you yeah. Get to. And like you know, there's swamps and like water just all over the place. Like you look at an area like on a map or you know from a plane, and you're like, oh, that looks pretty clear. We could probably walk around there like no problem. And then you get there, and the grass is over your head or something. You know, things you can't account for until you're on the ground. Mm. So, so it was, we end up spending a few more days and we didn't, it got really nice, sunny and warm and the bears really, they're just not really moving around when it's that way. I mean, they have big fur coats on yeah. and, uh, it's not really their weather unless at night, you know, they're more active, you know, but, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so we spent basically seven days out there and then got picked up from Billy again, brought back to town. Um, and then the last kind of hurdle to get back home was I had a ticket booked on Raven Airlines, which is a small carrier in Alaska. And they're notorious for like backing out if the weather's bad. Okay. So. Good reason. Yeah. I think. I mean, you don't yeah, want to be the... the you don't want to be in the plane that actually, yeah. yeah. So it was a Tuesday and for whatever reason, I <clears> tried <throat> this other smaller uh, air carrier and it was like, you guys got a flight out? And they're like, yeah, sure we do. Uh, I paid $800 for a one-way flight uh, to get out a day early and then come to find out Norm was on the Raven flight that we were supposed to both to be on, but I canceled it, get on. Lake Clark Air Service. Mm -hmm. He decides to wait till Wednesday. Sure enough, it's blowing like crazy out there. They don't come. So he gets stuck there. Is he back yet? Yeah, he got back. I think he... (laughs) So he also had to pay the 800 bucks to get back on Lake Clark Air Service. So do they have a different type of plane, take more risks? Same planes, but they just got confidence. (laughs) (laughs) I guess. I guess, you know... Okay. I'll just say when we when I landed there, that was the scariest I've ever been, or the most scary moment I've ever had in an airplane. Landing at Sandpoint. Was that on Raven? That was on Lake Clark. Uh, both there and back. Yeah, we made uh, so like there's a cliff on one side, and then there's the runway, and then it's like the ocean, you know, and the waves are just white capping down below, <laughs> so that doesn't look good, and then the plane is about to hit the runway and it just this big gust of wind and it just is and uh gets a full throttle make another pass and tries to land the other way and the whole time we're making the circle and the plane is just bouncing and bouncing and bouncing holy crap so now too that weather could happen to you when you're out hunting which it kind of did a little bit so um Anyways, the the trip getting back it ended up working out in my favor. Norm got stuck there, um, so now the like the last journey for this like hunting experience is basically to get the bear from my house to the taxidermist. Mm, okay, which I'm doing tomorrow. So it's so here. It's here. Yeah. So what do you do with a bear besides um, maybe the thrill of it that you, know, you said happened so quickly? What um, else happens? It's gonna get a rug made. Um, it's just about nine foot, so it's a good size bear for, especially for like my first brown bear. So, uh, I'm just going to get a rug and then the skull, uh, you can get separate. Okay. Uh, they're cool. We have a couple of black bear skulls, uh, laying around. So the that cool. you've, you've hunted. Yep. One's for me, one's for my wife. Um, they're just kind of cool to have sitting around, mm-hmm. you know, um, and to the guy that I'm bringing it to has these African beetles. And I guess you just put the skull in there and he lets them in there and they eat all the meat off of it. I don't know if he's got to put anything on it to kind of preserve it, but yeah. that process kind of sounds neat. <laughs> Do you get to see it or get a video of it? Uh, I'm sure you time, can probably look it up on YouTube or something, you know. So, But yours, Luke. Yeah. <clears throat> but I thought about maybe getting some claw, like a claw necklace or something made. But What about <clears throat> the meat? Do you eat it? Does something eat it? So... With brown bears, nobody really eats the meat off those. They just, uh, they're fishy and they're not really, 
uh, something you eat here. Okay. And actually, like a lot of people actually kind of have a problem with that. Um, now, if it's eating grass and berries or whatever, um, they can be good. Mm -hmm. Like the black bears that we've shot, you know, you just, you can process those. It, I mean, it's kind of like beef, you know, mix it with some fat, mix it with some bacon, okay. turn it into burger, and then you got black bear in your freezer and it's good. Interesting. But these bears, they eat a lot of fish and it's just, it's not good. So people have a problem with hunting something and not, you're like not using all. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, which I, I'm totally on board with that. You know, I, I kind of go by that, but. Like, had you discovered that this bear <laughs> had a different, like, Flavor texture profile. tone? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what we call it? Would you then? Um, yeah. I mean. Like, now, some, did someone tell you or you knew that it just, it wasn't going to be good to eat? I've actually had some. Somebody gave us some and it wasn't, it wasn't good. Like, the meat, it just like, it was burger, but it just was like had a funky taste and it didn't hold together very well and yeah there was a uh, in the harbor on the boat there was this uh like native alaskan lady and she was telling me like all these recipes like you could slice the meat up real thin and layer it in a bucket with salt and then you render the fat down and put it on silver salmon in the fall and as out of my culinary okay you know expertise so like, i'm not a hunter I totally get why people hunt, and uh, typically it's it's for the meat. So this is a case where, where mm. this bear is you know going to have some souvenirs in your home. Yeah. I guess the biggest thing is, there is there a lot of them. They're not endangered. Are you is not Alaska endangered. overrun with them basically, or <laughs> not guess, endangered? Yeah, there's definitely a, a a healthy population. And this this the the hunt that I did too. Um, so is usually done. Uh, Spring hunts are on even years, and fall hunts are on odd years. Okay. But because of COVID, uh, they didn't have any hunts last year. So that's why they had a spring. They're going to do a spring and a fall in the same year. And year. I assume there's a Department of Natural Resources in Alaska that's got a pretty good grasp on how many bear maybe should be hunted each year to, to keep the <clears throat> population in a healthy balance. Did they do um, that? I've heard of some like statistics of them trying to figure out the number of bears like down on the Kenai Peninsula and they had they did this test thinking there was x amount of bears per mile square mile and then come to find out like it was 10x what they thought it was oh so there there's a lot of bears out there okay a lot of bears so um and yeah fishing game we called uh you know uh I think Minnesota, they call it the DNR, yeah. but here it's like a, a fishing game. You know, they're always out there uh, checking people. They uh, landed on, they had a helicopter, basically landed right on our camp and make sure you got your hunting license, make sure you got your... So they found uh, you there. Yeah. They just, Did you have to tell them in advance where you're going to nope. do this? They nope. just show up and make sure that so you like where where So like where you were hunting is, you know, it's like on the ocean, it's a collection of little pockets of like a bay you know and they're just flying their helicopter in and out of these things looking for camps i mean everybody's right on the beach pretty much and you wouldn't really go so, deeply inland in a place where there's no roads i suppose to do this right unless you have i don't know what would you, you, could you even uh, do it? either a pl you know like the one of the super cubs if there was a, sp a spot to land you know you definitely could no okay. problem wouldn't that scare the bears um, away for a while in theory it would okay but being at this time of year when they're trying to, you know, wake up and get start eating and it's mating season, like, you know, not a lot can slow them down. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the trooper landed on us, made sure you got all your stuff, all your paperwork in order. You know, if you, once you shoot something, you got a little tag, you got to cut a notch in the dates. Um, and then make sure you have your locking tag and all that's put on the bear. And, um I've even heard of them, uh, guys that sheep hunt, and like right when they shoot the sheep and get it down, like they're flying a helicopter, making sure they put a notch in their tag. So sheep here in Alaska, or yeah. is it somewhere else? Doll okay. sheep, yeah. Hmm. Just roaming the wild. <laughs> yeah. Being food for what? Who's eating that thing? Doll sheep. Yeah. Wolves, bears. Okay. Yeah, they're on the menu. 
<laughs> that sounds like they're on the menu. So, it, so is that's one. It, how does this compare to your best hunting experiences? I would say this is the top. Okay. Um, just for all the fine details in it, made it such an epic trip. To especially going way out there, but I mean, hunting in Alaska, it's it's not like Minnesota. You know, you're not driving in the back 40 to sit in your deer stand for a day or yeah. two you know you gotta you gotta have like a side-by-side -side or a four-wheeler you gotta have gear for a couple of days you gotta have stuff uh you gotta like know where you're going you gotta know which game unit you're gonna be in um and you, you gotta drive hours and hours to get there and kind of hope nothing goes wrong and then you gotta find animals so it's a really challenging place to hunt, you know. Um, this last fall I had a cow moose tag that I got. It was like a, a draw hunt. And out in the Palmer Wasilla area, when you're driving through, you're like, oh, there's moose everywhere out here. Mm -hmm. But when it came time to, like, go shoot one, I, I had to spend, like, five, six days really? trying to find one. And it was way at the top of a mountain, <laughs> it, like, as far as the trail went. And then it was like another 300 yards up the hill. Wow. Yeah. So <clears throat> you got to have the means to get out there, which is why having an airplane and something to get you further than like the next guy out, you know. As I said, I'm not a hunter, but these do sound like great adventures. What about it is <clears throat> like the peak moment? I would say the peak moment is obviously getting something, but... Um, just being out there in the moment is really what does it for me because no trip is the same you know you could go to the same spot and have multiple hunts but you know having everything and all your planning kind of come to fruition and being there just out there you know in most cases there's nobody you know and you like that that's pretty cool <laughs> You know, it's to plan it and pull it off and be successful and nobody gets hurt. You know, it's, that's challenging to pull off. So when you can do that repeatedly, even if you don't kill an animal, mm -hmm. it still feels good to have that success, you know. Do you hear of trips gone terribly wrong where people are, are dying yeah. or being like stuck behind somehow? Yeah, there's a lot of... There's a lot of places you can go. I mean, really any place. You could go up hiking here in town and next thing you know, there's a bear coming out and mm. attacking you. Or um, people are out riding their four-wheelers and, you know, like last summer, I think this 11-year-old kid like dipped over and started rolling down a hill and it killed him. And, or you're driving your new Jeep out to a glacier and next thing you know, it busts through the ice uh -huh. and... and now you're stuck out there, 30 miles from anybody, you know? Um, yeah, that's why I say you gotta be prepared for, you gotta be prepared for it all. So you just had this trip. Are you itching to get back out and hunt somewhere again or does it happen kind of infrequently? Um, I'd like to go this fall, maybe for a moose. Okay. Uh, but with two kids Yeah. and all that, it can be a little challenging. So that's why I, I wasn't going to go because I was like, I want to go and shoot something I could eat. Yeah, okay. You know, but the way the trip presented itself and just knowing like what it takes for guys to go and do that, I figured it was a good opportunity to take. So. Do you think you would make an effort yeah. to do that again or is it not really a thing? I would. However, you, you have to, if you get a bear, you have to wait four years oh, okay. before you can go again. So it's not something you can do every year. So I could go with somebody. Um, I just couldn't hunt. So, What else do you hunt? Or do people hunt here? Moose, caribou, goats, sheep. Uh, that's about it. Bears. Man, for some reason, I never thought of sheep of anything except being on a farm. But obviously yeah. everything was in some way in the wild or at least there. These things, you were. like, you're driving and you see like a sheer cliff and it's just got sheep all over it. <laughs> okay. It's kind of crazy just to see how they're all out there. 
you know what? I was in Australia. No, sorry. Where was I? I was in Greece, the island of Crete, and there was there was big fluffy sheep around. Yeah. And I forgot about that. Okay, they're just roaming. Yeah, around. they're all over. I mean, even in Hawaii, the mountains out there, they have like mouflon sheep and these weird goats out there. Yeah. They seem like they must be friends, the goats and the sheep. Maybe. Oh. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> all I know is I would never hunt a sheep or a goat because I'm kind of scared of heights. And I'm tall, so tall people, steep cliffs, wet rocks. It just doesn't <laughs> How really... How tall are you? I'm 6'4". Okay. Yeah. 76 inches, if you want to do the math. Your, your home is on an incline here, so as I got out of my car and you were above me, you looked like seven feet tall. <laughs> so, yeah. Everybody always says, oh, you got so tall. I'm like, when's that going to stop? <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah. That's uh, a little more about Alaska. Like, and you said there's uh, maybe the second family or non-family member that you've seen. Browervillian. From Browerville that's, yeah. that's made it up here that you've gotten a chance to see. People aren't coming here. You're obviously making a life here. First off, do you think most likely you'll, you'll make your life here? For the long run? For the foreseeable future, yeah. Okay. Yep, definitely. Um, It's just a great place. Uh, And like I said, my wife's from here, so... And her parents just bought a house down the road, so we have grandpa and grandma super close. Okay. Um, So it's just, you know, making our little mark on the world here, you know? Yeah. Um, I always think about other places where I would go if I didn't pick here. What suits Um, you besides here? I'd like to go to Reno. Okay. Yeah. I just like that area. I like having the, the desert and the snow, and Tahoe is pretty cool. I said I was there beginning of December. Never really made a point to go there before, and I, I see it. It has, I think, qualities like this, qualities like, I think when people move to Colorado, mm-hmm. you have so much nature and I don't know, with the mountains and all sorts of different activities, mm-hmm. reasonably close, beautiful place. Um, yet you still have a, a functioning city where you can work and do your thing. Yeah. Um, the, well, the one thing I kind of miss about being in Alaska is the you can't go to like a Twins game or something. Oh, I was thinking about that. Why? What would it take to get a professional sports team here? Probably? Yeah. The stuff like that. And I, you know, I like to go to like concerts and do they shows just not come? And... Do the major? Does who who comes here for a concert? Like how can they even a, <laughs> usually? They it's it, more probably. like mainstream type. Music, not really into a whole lot of that. Um, I mean, we'll go, you know. Um, like the state fair has a lot of big names and stuff that comes through, and uh, but yeah, just not a lot of people come. More people went to Hawaii than come to Alaska okay. for for shows. I guess because they want a vacation there. Makes sense. They don't think of Alaska. You could vacation. So here. that gets me to my other question for someone that hasn't been here yet or someone that maybe is looking for a place to move what's something we haven't talked about that you could would be in a reason to advocate for this is why you're here um i know we've covered a lot but there must be something else that we have to considered. advocate why i'm here um it still has that small feel to it you know even though anchorage is a big city and it has its own problems um and you're close enough to just get out there and be away from people. You know, if you want a secluded adventure, you can get out and do it. And even if you don't do that, you can go somewhere and the views are good. You know, the beers are good. The food is good. Um, and you just have the ability to, you know, do what you want out there. Yeah. You know? One thing I planned to do today, but it was closed. There's like a, a native heritage museum that I hadn't, I didn't get to. The, I went to the main Anchorage Museum, which had some stuff related to that as well. But again, me not thinking about Alaska, there was many tribes already here long before the white man decided to come find whatever they could to, to make money off of coming to Alaska. Mm-hmm. And I guess I just didn't think about that. It, it, like Inuit is a term, is that used for all the people or what how do, how do they describe them the native uh, people of Alaska? This is, i'm going to be terrible at this okay. but i'm not really sure okay that's fine 
I know Inuit is a word. Um, I mean, a lot of people just say native. Yeah. I and mean, even the the natives that I have had experience with, they just say they're native, you know. Do you think the integration over the, the decades is, like, I know the mainland. I, I know, I've definitely heard it's been rough in a lot yeah. of places. Um, I've heard some crazy stories, too, about how how they manipulate people out there and any way to basically get money. Um, but I think it all depends on where it is and, you know, what industry is having an impact on them, mm -hmm. um, whether it's mining or fishing. Um, yeah. It's, I don't uh, really know how positive or negative it is, but just because those places are so far out there, like I've never been to yeah. any of them, you know? Um, I mean, just the most of the experience just here in town. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's, uh, it's almost kind of like the, I would say almost kind of like the reservations in Minnesota. Mm hmm um, because a lot of the people from the villages or whatever that have problems, they just kind of get sent to town and they don't have anywhere to go and kind of adds to the homeless population, the homeless population. And, and two, once they get into, into the big town, you know, they can get into all sorts of trouble. Yeah. Just bring a lot of things that they're not used to to their doorstep. Yeah, but kind of getting sidetracked from the initial question. But yeah, no, it's it's just as I go different places, like who was here first, mm -hmm. and how has their life been impacted by who came second, third? Well, or so fourth? like the you know the Russians came here a long time ago. Along in the southeast, there's like Russian Orthodox churches. Oh, really? And I think even in some of the areas like where I was out there, like Norwegian people were here in the 16, 1700s. Um, because there's, I guess there's like some native people that are like blonde hair, blue eyes, mm. but they're Alaska natives. Okay. You know, so super diverse place. Yeah. You look around, you see lots of different types of people, I guess it's. Yeah. Yeah. Anchorage, I think is one of the most diverse, well rated, you know, you read about it or whatever in the paper. Um, but one of the most culturally diverse places because you have, I mean, people from the military coming up and you have all sorts of different like fishing industries and oil and just people from all over the world coming together and you have like the Alaska native population just kind of everything and it's in this small little you know the Anchorage Bowl it's all it's kind and of I weird. suppose there was jobs emerging here as a place to come if you need it work wanted a, a new start and <clears> anyone can say yes to that and show up and it seems like that's what happened yeah the pipeline from Prudhoe Bay to like Valdez that kind of had a big boom here um, which is still a thing and provides a lot of jobs up here. So I know you've listened to my podcast before, so you might be familiar with the being wrong segment. So we're, we'll close out the conversation with that. If you can think about something related <laughs> to whatever you want, where you, you've thought about and realized you've really drastically changed your <clears throat> mind about, maybe it's related to something we've already talked about. What's a life lesson <clears throat> that you can, you can teach me and anyone that listens to us here today? Man, so <clears throat> being wrong, um, I would say to not going into things with confidence, you know, trying to like <clears throat> think you can do something totally new without, um, you know, th thinking you know everything mm -hmm. um, or trying to be always right. Um, is something I kind of learned to fix about myself early on. So you would enter with confidence when you shouldn't, or you didn't have to, confidence to, when you um, to to go go at things without it. Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of half-ass something. Yeah, you know, because I mean, coming up here, I was 18 years old and I just got out of Minnesota. You know, it was a kind of a learning experience and a social shock. You know. I had like this 
Midwest innocence to me and um, and to just get exposed to so many new things it, it just takes a lot of if you don't go at it with confidence and try to accomplish it you know you might not get the results you you would hope for so and when when and how did you really click with this lesson um <clears throat> Once you kind of realize that you're, uh, how do I want to say this? Um, the people that <clears throat> go at things when they think they have it all figured out and you see them not succeed repeatedly, you know, uh -huh. that attitude was started to become like a turn off to me okay so <clears throat> i just kind of was like you got to have an open mind and approach things you know clearly confidently um i mean whatever it is you know like uh doing you know when we started doing like crossfit workouts you know you're getting into this whole new thing whole new people doing jujitsu um, going in and getting choked on the mats and intertwining yourself in these social circles. Um, it's not something you just want to, if it's something you want to try to be successful at or good at, um, you just have to have confidence. You know, if you're going to try to hit a lift, like a PR deadlift or, and you go up to the bar you have to go up to the bar thinking like you're going to hit it. You know, if you don't, you're probably not. If the thought in your mind is, I might not do this, yeah. you're not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, hyping yourself up, I'm going to go for this, and you're okay. going to get to the bar, and you're going to be like, maybe I can't do this. You know, so one of those kind of approaches the things that you can intertwine into everything. So what's an example then recently, now that you... You've learned this lesson, had some experience really adapting to your life. What's oh, something that you've, you've done with this level of confidence <laughs> that, that you realized some years ago you just you wouldn't have had the same approach? Uh, to really just kind of lean, lean into your decisions. Um, I would say like the move to Hawaii, mm. you know, that was a big step for us, especially just being married. But once we kind of made the decision to go and we just, you just, we leaned into it and we didn't really look back. So <clears throat> if it's going to be a big enough decision, just, if you're going to go all in, just, just head it and, and don't look back. So I like that. It's good advice. Luke, I appreciate you doing this. No problem. Nice to, nice to know somebody in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get enough visitors. <laughs> well, hopefully everyone that you've ever met will watch this episode of People I Know Show and, and yeah. you'll have too many people coming over to see your, your new bear rug. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. It's going to be a while before I get it back. Okay. So. Well, they got some but, time. And I got to find a wall to put it on. I have a weird shaped house. So <laughs> that's going to be the, the first challenge once I get it done. So, Cool, man. I appreciate yeah. the stories. I appreciate the, the life lessons sharing here. And Yeah, thanks. As an avid podcast listener, it's definitely strange to be on the other end of a microphone. So you do well. You could do this more often. If people maybe. knew you existed, besides me. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I bet you've got some more stories that are pretty cool. Definitely do. Okay. For sure. So appreciate it, man. Right on. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat>